it's time to talk tutors. We went, started to go down this path, and I feel like I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here with you. And <laughs> fe feel free to pull me out if you need to. The Tutors Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast with Rebecca Larson. When people delve into the history of Henry VIII, the conversation often centers around his six wives and the consequences they faced as his consorts, particularly which ones met their untimely end. However, today I am thrilled to be joined by Andy McMillan to shed light on a lesser known aspect of these six Tudor queens. Their jointures. Furthermore, we'll challenge the notion that these women simply whiled away their days doing needlework and reading, when in reality, there was a great deal more to their lives than meets the eye. Andy, welcome. Well, hello. <laughs> I am so excited to have you on the show today because we're covering a topic that I don't think I've ever covered on the show before. We're going to talk about, well, in general, maybe jointures, dowries, dower lands, all of these fun things, aren't we? Yes, we so sure are. So why don't you give listeners just a little bit of your background so that they know why I came to you on this subject? Thank you again for having me on the show. I am now a current MPhil student with the University of Winchester. My topic is basically I'm looking at the six Tudor queens and their jointures and dowers and the land in their lands that they have um which they held as queens consorts of henry the eighth and how they changed over time um my background before i went to winchester i was studying margaret of anjou and elizabeth woodville i did a, a brief history you know of their household accounts which also looked at their lands um it wasn't as extensive as what i'm doing now and then before that my master's dissertation was on Edward the Fourth and Richard the Third and their religious um, endowments and patronage during their reigns. That all sounds. What I talked about, yeah. So I, I would say I have probably have equal amount in the past ten years of studying War of the Roses people versus Tudor queens. So oh, uh, both are then, my favorites. I'm so glad yeah. you have all this knowledge because this is going to come yeah. in handy for our conversation today. I think. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start out with the most basic because there might be okay. people listening right now who know nothing about any of this. So, can you maybe explain the difference between what a dowry is, what dower lands are, and what jointures are? Yes. Well, a dowry is what the prospective's husband would pay the, the bride's family. So we're not necessarily talking about that when we say dower land. Dower land is what she claims in dower, which is kind of like a gift when the in my situation, the king and the queen, they got married, you know, the, the king up to about the term was used to about the 1400s, 1300s, it starts to change to jointure, but that's a little bit, it's a legal definition that changes. So what it meant was that she would, they would get married and she would have these properties granted to her in life or in dower, according to the documents um, that were contracted upon their marriage, saying you would have the revenues or, you know, the proceeds from these lands to support your household, to support your way of life while you were still married. Now, there was a provision that was made later that when the husband died, she would still have a portion of that property to help her through widowhood. That would be the jointure. Now, during Henry VIII's reign, he made what was called statue of uses, which made it where you could have either or, you couldn't have both. For a long time, people had both. Um, queens now had 
either a dower or a jointure. And what you see with Henry's queens over time is the word dower starts to disappear from record. Um, sometimes it's used interchangeably, but they more people, especially towards when we get to later after tutors like say Anna of Denmark, it's jointure at this point in time because she's still holding those lands after her husband dies. Um, there are some incidences say with Catherine of Aragon when which is a new thing is she's still alive. She and Henry, they have their divorce. There was a time where he took her lands from her, which they then there was a big legal process with the Pope where they had to get her lands back because they technically were hers. So you see her lands going different places for different points of time because it's they've become a ping pong ball. So finally it was agreed that she was to keep them and then her lands do not go back to another queen until she dies and you see this with all of henry's con you know consecutive queens um there there is an incidence with anna cleaves though she does you know divorce henry all her lands that she held in jointure go back to the crown but then she gets a whole brand new package as an annulment grant so she almost gets like what we would call today you know her settlement, her divorce settlement, and that keeps her until she passes away. Um, but then those lands that she held when she was married briefly to Henry go to Catherine Howard, and then they keep, you know, they keep going and going. Were, so. were those lands that Anna, Anna of Cleves received after the divorce or annulment, were any of them ones that she had when she was married? Like, did they? No. None of them. They were brand no. new. They were all, they, I think... From what I can remember, that it was a completely new grant. One of the other they completely oh. washed it, and then because a lot of them they were like specifically for the queen consort. So yeah, mm. yeah, it was a completely new thing. It was like the slate was completely wiped clean, and here you go. Because Henry, well, I guess traditionally, if it's a queen's manor, it needs to stay with you know the queen. That is like the thing with all of them. And that's what I've seen from my research is that they pretty much stay with the consort unless there's some crazy little factor which doesn't seem to pop out but they're all pretty much they, they maintain this consistency over time thank you for clearing that up but you did <laughs> you did make me think of a, a, a question and then i started yeah. getting confused about the different types so when catherine of aragon came over and yes. married arthur she brought stuff with her what would we call that well it depends on what she bought she did bring people <laughs> so as i say in people she did brought um you know some ladies in waiting from spain she brought some officials with her um she would have brought from what i remember she had they had upon her marriage to arthur i think only part of her dara had point had been paid but i'm not 100 percent positive but she did not bring I mean she brought like the title of princess of Spain with her in terms of what she had in Spain I don't I'm not sure but they they would gain more influence you know Henry didn't become the king of Spain because he married Catherine of Aragon he was still king of England if anything he bought he got diplomatic ties and an ally when he got married um and that would be been the same with Arthur Tudor um they were married for such such a short period of time, and she wasn't queen; she was princess of Wales. So the documentation is a bit iffy in in terms of what exactly she brought with her. But at that point in time, I think it was it was probably planned that they would eventually be king and queen. But with how things worked out, that didn't happen. Um, Arthur died, and you know she became a widow very young, and then you know Henry the Seventh was you know, oh, well, maybe if we'll marry, you know, these people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it, it, things didn't turn out quite the way I think they were intended. Um, That's an understatement. So, yeah. And I think there's a lot of speculation into Henry and why he married Catherine. Um, it's a little bit outside my research topic. I mean, it's one of those things that's on the side bench to, if I will just, you know, research this more, but yeah. Um, it is very interesting. It's one of those rabbit holes I'm being told, don't go down. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to what you're studying now. <laughs> right. Well, sometimes it's so easy to go down those rabbit oh, it's holes. It's hard. It is so hard. Um, that's been the, the biggest challenge, I think, 
especially with reading a lot of the sources I've had, especially letters and papers, is because there's so many different letters, there's so many different documents from different people. You know, you read it and you get bits and pieces there, just the language and, you know, you get a general feel of how the relations were, you know, between Ferdinand and Isabella and Catherine and Henry and everything, you know, over time. It's it's very, very interesting. I think that's probably one of my favorite things about the Tudors is there's so much that kind of documentation that survives that you get a feel for what the people were really like. And now a word from our sponsor. When Henry VIII married Anne Boleyn, was there any exchange of money with that marriage? That, I do know she was granted a dower, which was about, I can't remember, but they, it was a standard for everybody, which was 45, I believe 4,500 pounds I would get per year. But that was revenue they were expected to receive with their properties. Um, in terms of what she actually, you know, the dowry that I'm not 100% queued up on only because that's really not what I was looking at because that's a completely separate matter that would have been a contract more contractual thing with the Bolins I think when Henry married Anne it was more for it was because of the diplomatic relations Thomas had in France he was getting more access for that but also the Bolins were also trying to go up the scale in terms of socially um, and politically so they were, you know, that is the biggest thing I have seen with my research is these families that are marrying into the, with the king, they're also, they have their own agenda. It's not just the king, it's the families have their own um, at the end of the day. Ambition rules all. Yeah, it's definitely a big ambition hike um, for both, um, you know, and you know, we, we know that during, I believe it was Anne Boleyn's run when he had the jousting accident, that really played into Henry's judgment. Um, a lot of historians have discussed that. Um, and you see that with just the practices of his wives, um, the, some of the acts that you, I've, you know, I've gone through for just my paper about how, you know, landed law has changed, how it was reflected with the queen's dowers and things like that. Just how he grants things. It gets very sporadic. Um, people he chooses to have in his administration, how he quickly changes his mind. Um, you know, they, I've, I watched a program the other day where there wasn't even 100% concrete evidence against Catherine Howard, yet he had her executed, you know, um, he, he was not well at the end of the day. Um, and some of the, the things I've seen with even these, with the Queen's joiners and dowers, it's, it's a mirror of that, um, of what happens. I mean, and even with Catherine Parr, uh, how it seems that the Seymours are pretty much running the show um, towards the very end. And we have Henry's will. I've read Henry's will, and it's it's very. I don't want to say it's straightforward, but it's very open ended in some parts. And then I know there was a lot of challenges against it. And I think if people hadn't realized that he hadn't been well, they wouldn't have been challenging it as much as they had. Um, but basically, he passed away, and people just swooped in. Yeah, they sure did. They really did. They really, really did. Um, and what you see as well as with all the Queen's lands that I have been studying, um, the power, especially in Wiltshire, you think it would go to the Queen or it would be pretty much centered around the Queen, but no, there's like a secret little bubble of lesser nobility who are gaining lands amongst themselves, trading and buying, especially after dissolution of monasteries, and they're almost making their own little landed empires. And they're just encroaching on the monarchy in terms of wealth and power. Um, the Seymours did it, but ultimately it, it led to their downfall. Um, Thomas, sorry, uh, John Thine, who owned Longley, he definitely was in at it. Um, Hungerford's tried, but a couple Hungerford um, families, they, um, they lost some heads due to some uh, weird behaviors. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of them was executed the same day as Thomas Cromwell oh, uh, wow. for buggery, which is a bit peculiar. Um, but yeah, I mean, a 
a lot of people and it wasn't just in Wiltshire it was in Norfolk it was in different parts of the country as well um but yeah it's very interesting stuff it is well let's shift back to jointures yes. again and I'm interested in knowing if all six of Henry's queens had identical jointures no i mean they were i would say the base properties were pretty much standard but over time they would get add a couple added new ones or what would happen is a lot of them would be held by you know a, a more senior royal you know official or family member they would pass away and a lot of them would get redistributed and some would end up as queen's lands um between the time of Elizabeth of York and Catherine of Aragon, Cecily Neville, who was Edward IV's mother um, and also Elizabeth of York's grandmother, she passed away. She held quite a few properties that had originally been Queen's lands um, during the time of the War of the Roses. Um, and she was granted a whole bunch of properties from um, Margaret of Anjou. So when she died, some of those got reciprocated to Catherine of Aragon. Um, there is a, a group that was in Wiltshire that she held that Elizabeth of York and Catherine of Aragon also eventually got because um, I as I call them, I, I made them into clusters. So there was this cluster A that everybody had had for a really long period of time. And, and then all of a sudden there's this cluster B, which is about six six different properties um, in Wiltshire. And then because she died, they got put back into the jointure package of Catherine of Aragon. And those maintain pretty much consistently through all the queens. Um, and then there's some counties where you'll see complete total shifts where you'll have, say, six different properties. And then you go to another queen and they are cycled out. But then the next queen later has them again. Um, but I would say on average, there is at least some properties that have maintained consistent patterns over time. Um, where I'm at, I would say Melksham, Devizes Castle is a very consistent pattern uh, or a state that is held throughout time, all six queens. I'm trying to think of some other really famous ones. I should probably just pull up my database and then it'll be there. <laughs> I think one of those so many properties. As you were talking, it, you know, it reminded me that how probably how many, how long ago was it that you and I initially emailed and you were helping me with the jointure of Catherine Parr? Was it a year, two years ago? I think it was like two years ago. Yeah, so I you can't remember. It seems like it's a been a while. <laughs> well, I think it was looking at Catherine Parr's jointure. That yes. opened my eyes to what was actually included. I think in my head before mm -hmm. I had seen it, I just pictured buildings, but it wasn't just buildings, was it? Yeah, it's it's a manor, and we're, and like how we refer to manors is people would like. I would say I don't want to say it's an American thing, but some people think, oh, a manor, like a manor house. No, a manor is like a whole estate of like a, the biggest thing. It'd be like a really really large farm that's like could be composed of a forest, a couple parks, churches, parishes, that whole big plot of land would be called a manor. It's like a community, if that makes sense. But that's what we refer to a manor. Some of them are fee farms, some are forests, we have parks, we have priories that some queens held interest in that they would receive money out of. Um, they would, you know, have a town there would be also a term called a ballywick or a borough, which is very English term. Um, this, it's not just confined to little buildings or, you know, little farms or estates. Um, they could also hold a castle like Castle Fordenay, where Mary Queen of Scots was beheaded. Queen held that in, in jointure and in dower. So as I pull up my big, massive, huge database, um, I one consistent farm, I would say that most of the queens held Ipwich had a little farm, but only three of my queens held at one point in time. Um, yes, Castle for there, all six queens except who's this one? Oh, that's 
Yeah, all six of them held Castle Fordane, which is where Mary Queen of Scots was, which was also like the basically the the birthplace of Cecily Neville. She, they, she had that. Um, in Wiltshire, which is where I, my primary study is, which one of the biggest reasons why we picked Wiltshire and why I picked it is because it had the largest grouping of consistently held properties of all the six Tudor queens. So Marlborough was one. Um, mm -hmm. Savernac Forest, which is another. Devizes Castle, which I mentioned. Um, Melksham. Um, all these places were all consistently held over time by all six queens. Um, I don't think I realized that Savernac Forest was held by the queens because the Seymours mm -hmm. were the wardens of it. See, they're the wardens. So technically, they're also servant of the queen, but the queen held interest in it. So she, and all one thing about the forest, because I have I had to learn about all the forests and how they worked in in for my project is the forests are ultimately owned by the king. Um, the Seymours held a hereditary wardenship with Savernac, which they gained from the Sturmies, which was from like the 13th, 12th century. Um, and they gained that through marriage. So it stayed in the family. Today, it's still managed and run by Forest Jesus of England, the, which is the crown basically. Um, whether you would you could say the Seymours owned it, they kind of it's kind of more like they I don't want to say they lease it, they don't lease it, but they have it is owned by the king. You know, he then there was point one point in time where the Sturmy family before the Seymour side, they had the force taken away completely. He lost his wardenship because he had irritated the king. Um and that's one thing you even see that with the Dower and Jointure properties, um, not with my queen's. Well, yes, you do see it with my queen. You saw it with Catherine of Aragon and her divorce. Henry took all her property away, including her, you know, her estates. Right. Um, but Queen Isabella had that happen with Edward, was it Edward II, I think, Edward II or III. But yeah, or Isabella Castile, one of them. But she had him taken away because the king thought she was spending too much money. So he took her jointure properties away. <laughs> you know, control they, the money. They do that, you know, because they are the ultimate landowner as you say right yeah. yeah so i have to circle back to something that you mentioned just a little bit ago because mm -hmm. i want to understand how this works you mentioned that in a jointure the queen consort um could have a town how on yes. how do they make money from a whole town well so how they would make ten money from a town is they would have tithes which is um where they would gain the how little towns work is everyone would have, say, a market. So the queen would get a, per, a percentage of the proceeds made in that market. And how they would do that is, say, in the manner that, you know, like I was explaining earlier, they're made up of all different types of things, farms, little towns, parishes. You would have this man called a bailiff. And what the bailiff would do, he would be in charge of all of the queen's livestock sales. He would take things to market. He would help, you know gather taxes from people, um, any rent owed, anything. So how she would get the money is she would get the portion of rents that would be owed to her. Um, she would get a portion of, you know, if say some of those sheep that would sell yesterday were hers, she would get the money for the sheep. And the bailiff would gather the money and then, you know, make a record of the account of the money, take the money, go to the receiver, and then the receiver would report to the receiver general, and that would eventually make its way to the coffers of the queen. Um, so pretty much that's how she'd make money, um, is kind of through that process. And part of my, my research has been, you know, tracking who were the bailiffs, what did they do, what was the revenue that they received from, say, the manor at, you know, Longbridge Devil for, you know, 1549, you know, how much did they pull? Um, and I have, you know, I have records of that. And that would be the Queen's revenue for that year. Um, interesting thing is, you know, we're sitting here today and like 2023 going, oh, man, they probably made thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. No, they maybe made about 30 pounds a year, maybe 40. But to us, 
today, that's a lot of money. And today's, you know, if we were to use a converter, but mm-hmm. back then a pound was a lot of money. Right. You know? So yeah, that's kind of how they got their money. Andy, I, I need you to turn your research into a book. Could you do this for me? <laughs> I would like to one day. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah. fascinating. And I feel like there's not enough information out there on this no, topic. No, and that's primarily why it it's, you know, my topic. Um, originally, that's why I picked it for a PhD. But as we found out, you know, it's there's a lot of information, a whole lot. I have, it's like 20, I have 20 years of research. I could just go to town on, you know, and pick this up, pick that up. Um, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot there that no one really talks about economic history, even tied to the queen economic history of the period itself is just not, it's not very well. I would almost say it's not well researched. It's not researched enough. Um, and there's a lot of new ground to cover for it, which is, you know, why I'm in it. it you know, I'm, I'm doing new things, you know. Love it. Because people don't know about it. You know, they, they think what they see on TV is like how it worked. Nope. <laughs> it was far more complex than what we see on TV. Oh, you know, it's very, yeah, it's very complex, especially when you get into the administration side, how the queen administered the manners, which is, you know, a chunk of my research. How did this all work? You know. It's all these little communities. They're all working, you know, with their little own symbiosis in this big, huge ecosystem under the queen's umbrella, you know, to help her household. But at the same time, they're also creating their own little households um, and own their own little empires. And, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not necessarily empires, but, you know, they're building, we're in that phase where they're building towns. Um, Where I live, it started off as basically church owned you know, like I said, grain producing, money making machines for the Abbey. Um, over time, that became sheep pastures because uh, England got very heavily into the wool trade and it developed into a market town, um, a pretty decent market town where people at the reign of Mary the First were going down the streets ringing in her reign. So, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I'm so. We went started to go down this path, and I feel like I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here with you. And <laughs> fe- feel free to pull me out if you need to. But I I want to go back to how the queen managed these things because that is so fascinating to me. I mean, sh- she wakes up in the morning, she does her routine. When does mm-hmm. she go about administrating? You know, with her staff regarding her like how does that look I don't even know how to ask this question how does it how look does for the queen her properties yeah. well being the queen <laughs> she had her receiver generals um and they pretty much managed her properties for her she would have been today the corporate version of a CEO she if anything she signed a paper there is record of um I have found and since Catherine Parr she did there are her, on some of my accounts are her initials, whether that's actually her receiver using her initials or her, that's kind of left up to history. But Elizabeth of York, mind you, did go through her account books for all her money. So she was aware of what was going on. Um, but they would, you know, they would get these receiver general reports of how much this was producing, but it was a process. It it more than likely didn't happen every single day. Um, if anything, she would probably get told of the big problems or if there was, you know, a revolt happening or people were refusing to pay, you know, the rent, she might have, she would possibly hear of that. And that would, you know, or of a case possibly going towards the Queen's bench where she had to intervene, which they did happen. Um, There are some where I have, you know, information of people writing to Cromwell about a queen's lease. So there is, you know, information about that. Obviously she would have heard of, oh, but did you hear so-and-so's family, you know, has died. They were in service to you. They wish to, you know, renew their lease or, you know, have it passed on through the family. She would more than, she put possibly would hear of those instances. Um, But whether she actually physically was going to her properties and going, so who paid rent today did not happen. in terms of did she visit some of her properties uh out of all the ones in wiltshire we know 
Henry VIII did visit Savernac Forest at least th three times, but that was mainly because he was going to see John Seymour and he met um, Jane there. But they also, there's a report saying he met Jane at Clifton Foliat Manor. Um, and then there is a progression report that, and this is later, that Anna Denmark went through Cannes, which is also a, a queen held manor, but that happened later. Um, a lot of the Queen's estates were on a major travel route, um, whether that was for the Queen or the King, it was mainly for safety and for, you know, transporting good purposes. Um, but like I said, in terms of how she administered them, she would have a receiver general who would have been appointed by her council. He would have, you know, then there would be receivers, which also worked for her, which worked with the bailiff. Um, a lot of times the queens never physically visited or met these people. Some of them that I have found in my research did work in court, so she might have been aware of who they were, but pretty much anyone under the bailiff, so your farmers, your yeoman, um, you know, whoever was dealing with the liberties, they probably did not have a daily interaction with the queen, but yet they still were working under her and they all did their work for her. So today's modern terms of thinking her as a CEO, say, of Apple, would she be concerned with, you know, a junior, you know, computer software designer? No, you know, that's the type of relationship that she would have had with everybody in her lands, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Did she get to choose the people who worked for her or did the king choose? She had a say. Um, a lot of them were um, in from what I'm finding, some of the positions like bailiff, especially for like one manor that I have uh, for Cotton Follett, they stayed within the family, but all of the family had ties within her household or the king's household. So it was kind of expected they still carried it on. Um, some of them, you see a couple grants, um, but they already held the position. However, for one, Anthony, I mean, they're all, the appointments, it depends on how they're recorded. Sometimes they say this person's been granted this by the king or the queen, but a lot of them say they are done by the queen. Anthony Hungerford was granted his appointments by the queen, um, but his family had already been in service um, for the queen already. Um, but a lot of times it's kind of an expected position, but they like, but one of the key aspects that I'm tying in it and I'm trying to, you know, defined with my research is that they just didn't get him because they were the man on the moon. They did something to deserve this position. So there was a reciprocating action going on, whether they had worked on you know, even the king's household or they had a previous position within the queen's. It's quite, it's almost expected that they're also going to have a, a somewhat senior position working her lands. Um, the queen's seem to very much use existing networks that they're familiar with and managing these properties. Um, one of the primary reasons is patronage influence. If you already know the people, you're gonna have stronger influence and then you'll have a more peaceful, you know, working on your land. It's gonna be more seamless in production. You're not gonna have disruption, which disruption during this period could be great. And you don't want that as, a, as any monarch because um, you wanna be seen as good. So people work for you, that they're loyal to you. Um, so that's one thing that there's, that you see, um, but you know, it, they utilizing that network for them is probably the most beneficial thing they do across the realm. And especially like, like I said, with Wiltshire, um, it's what maintains its stability over time, especially for these Queens. I think it's so fascinating to see these Queens in a different light because all too often we, only see them doing needlework or praying or reading, yeah. but really they had a business side to them as well. Yeah, very big, big business side. And what you see later Queens, which eventually I'm gonna take my research and bridge it um, to Anna of Denmark is you see efforts being made. So they start almost making an enterprise, making commercializing these lands under James the first he basically he enacts you know taxes and different statutes so he becomes his lands become almost like a business to the crown um 
with enclosure and every in all, all other landed changes that happen across the countryside. And um, that's one thing that you don't quite see with the Tudor Queens quite yet. Um, but that's a big change that happens. But under James I, the household expenditure went through the roof. You know, they had all these masks and everything. And you read the stories and you go, well, how are they paying for it? Well, they were sucking it out of the lands. <laughs> um, Henry to the point had an expensive uh, court, but I think James kind of beat it. So, yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about Catherine Parr because obviously she was married to Thomas Seymour and that whole thing yep. is of interest to me. But after mm -hmm. Henry VIII died, his son Edward VI um, came to the throne, except he was a minor. So his uncle yep. Somerset ruled as Lord Protector. There was an mm -hmm. instance where Catherine Parr wrote to Thomas Seymour about how upset she was that Somerset was trying to, I believe it was, lease some of her land to somebody yes. without her. Can you elaborate on that at all? Yes. So that was happening. That had been happening before Henry died. Um, I kind of stumbled on this in my research. And interestingly, Thomas Thine, who owned Longley, was one of, I wouldn't say, co I don't want to say co-conspirator, but he was kind of in on the whole, let's borrow the Queen's lands. But he actually was a friend of Catherine Parr's. So he was granted at one point in time, Longley, and then he had Longridge Deverell for a short period of time, but then he gave it back to Catherine Parr while she was married to Henry. And you see these properties, like I have all the little grants listed out, these properties go on flip, 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 flip. And it would make sense that she was angry because these were lands that were granted to her and joined her. So when she found out that it was being taken away, or, you know, at least to somebody else, she was not getting the profit. So it makes complete total sense why she would have been upset. She was also upset because there was a big hoo-ha about the queen's jewels that she was supposed to have that um, John Thine actually held the keys for. Um, when Henry died, they were all locked away. Um, but there was a big old, I don't want to say uh, scandal about that, but Anne Stanhope, she had said some something not really nice about the jewels but there was there's a speculation that she wanted them after Catherine died or Henry died but there was big old argument over the the jewels as well the queen's jewels yeah i just feel for cool. Catherine Parr and it seemed like the jewels that she really wanted were just ones that were her personal ones or ones that were mm -hmm. gifted not the queen's jewels yeah yeah i mean I don't go much into that into detail into my research, but it is it's interesting kind of just reading about it going, oh, <laughs> there's a lot more to this, you know, right for sure. Well, but, and, yeah, and I think it, I'm just so curious about it because how could Somerset, the Lord Protector, mess with the Queen's jointure lands. I mean, he's not the king. I mean, he's the king de facto. I, but I think he had a, a he had a, a a really he had a weird political agenda. But he also had he was also um, promoting some pretty obs I don't want to say obscure, but he was very Protestant, and yet he, he was very much manipulating. I feel um, Edward for his Protestant agenda. And I think a lot of it had to do with if he could get some more lands that would give him more influence to kind of, you know, stretch his Protestantism and, you know, this not to get more power. I don't know if he was trying to, at the end of the day, absurd Edward, um, but there was definitely something going on. Um, how much we know today, I'm not sure without, you know, seeing more letters and more, you know, research into that. But I think him and Thomas definitely had some things going on. I do know when Catherine Parr, before she married Henry, she was possibly going to marry Thomas, but that got called off. And that really hits the Seymours kind of bad. Um, it was a bit of a blow to them. They lost a bit of power because they were really, really hoping that Catherine Parr was going to marry Thomas because, uh, her father held quite a bit of land up north um, and that would have almost given them a really, really strong landed base comparable possibly that to the king at one point. But when she said no, 
married Henry, that kind of upset the apple cart, as they say. I still love, though, how in the end they got together. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's kind of weird. It's like, you marry the king, and then you go back to your sweetheart. Okay. Right. Well, I mean, how do you say no to Henry? I know. How? How could you? I mean, it's a king. Right. He know? could make your life miserable and your entire family's life miserable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you say no, it's not a good idea. No. And I could talk about Catherine Parr with you for the rest of this episode, but but, <laughs> <laughs> but I one of the things that I, I was just thinking of as you were talking about all of this was... Uh, what did you notice was the biggest difference between, oh, I don't know, maybe Catherine of Aragon's jointure and Catherine Parr's jointure? Was there a huge difference or anything that was noticeable to you that, oh, she had this, but she didn't or vice versa? The biggest noticeable, noticeable difference um, is that under Catherine Parr, you, see start, you start to see dissolved monasteries become queen's lands. And that's one of the things I do talk about in my research. Um, and that happened for various different reasons. You know, over time, estates, they don't keep maintaining money, but also at the same time, there are more lands to give. They, you know, the dollar amount, I would say the pound, you know, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't hold as much value. So you see more estates going into the queen's you know, jointure. Um, Catherine and Parr ended out of all of my six queens with the most properties. Why is that? Well, it could be lots of different reasons. You know, some got traded away, some weren't make producing so much. Um, lots of reasons, but you do see that change. Um, in terms of other differences, not not really that much. Besides the religious properties, um, their composition as in terms of where they were in the country was fairly consistent. Um, like I said, there's still some shifts, but if you compare like to like, the most of the dots on average align, except for the new ones, um, her properties also start going up north of the country. So there's a couple starting to go up north, which was a new thing because Henry for a long time had a hard time trying to get land and his queen specifically lands up north. Um, they were all, lots of them were still held by families um, that had dated, you know, were loyalists through, you know, the War of the Roses. So those were still being held up by, by, you know, ancestral ties there. But he did manage to get a couple of them up. And then if you extend, you know, the timeline further through Anna of Denmark, her lands go all the way up the country. She's, she comes to the crown with lands in Scotland as well. Which so. makes sense. Yeah, she's from Scotland. <laughs> well, she's from Denmark, but she had lands in Scotland. Right. Yeah. So the dissolution of the monasteries. So the monastery is dissolved. The money yes. that they're making off of that, was that just off of like farming and sheep and that type of stuff? A lot of the monasteries would gain money from, yes, from their farms, from their little practices they have. For example, like Longbridge Devil, you know, Glastonbury Abbey had a whole bunch of different manors throughout Gloucester, Wiltshire and Somerset, and they made their money through the farming practices, grain, um, different types of vegetables, uh, vetchy, barley, wheat. Um, they were very big into wheat production. So that would have been flour, you know, straw, after you take the wheat off. And the, like even what the, the one that I had, they had a mill, two mills at one point in time. So, so, I mean, they're not there now, but they, that's where all of, that's what they would use. Um, and that would make their money, but all that money was going to the, to the church, not the crown. Um, and then when Henry had his commissioners go through and survey all the monasteries, because desolation monasteries kind of happened in two waves. There was an initial wave where they just went through and said, that, that's it, you're gone. And then there was a second wave where if they were not making um, over two, 200 pounds a year, they were going to be axed. So a lot went then as well. And that got rid of a lot of the smaller ones. And that happened from 1530, about 1537, 36 to 39 in some cases. Some were even close as late as 1540. Oh, wow. So, okay. The one I'm studying closed its doors in 1539. 
was the last record I have of an abbot at that at that it was actually it was a priory with a rectory which is what it was and that was joined up with Glastonbury Abbey which is in Glastonbury and up in over the way about an hour from here yeah <laughs> Andy this yeah. has been so much fun I want to to end yeah. the show here with Maybe you telling me what the most interesting thing that you've come across in your research is. Probably the most interesting thing is just the diversity of lands that these queens held um, and how it's so, it's like a very harmonious process how everybody works. And there's, you know, it's not, you, you think, oh, it'd be this big old group of, you know, paper but it was very intricate they all had you know certain people did this certain people did that they're all you know when I was studying all the documents of the receiver accounts they were all very very much structured very this same everything was split up like identically over time with all six queens um and it is just really neat you know you wouldn't think it would be all so just organized and consistent but it is you know i when i went into it i was like oh man this is going to be crazy you know how am i going to find this but it's not it was just it's very structured um and then you know and i didn't think of even that there would be manners that would just be primarily cash based that's that was their main importance you know um it's it's neat you know and then to find that there's some parts of some of these places that are still in existence today, which is even, that's the even greatest part, I think. Um, Cause that kind of brings it all home. Um, especially if like today you can go up to Snabarack Forest and go have a walk around and it's just, you sit there and you're like, people were actually riding through this, the king and possibly maybe the queen right. in the 1500s. You know, and you're just and you're just walking around and you see these trees and they're ginormous trees. Absolutely ginormous. And they may have seen those same trees. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, Andy, yeah. thank you so much. Now, if people yeah. have further questions for you after listening to this episode, how can they find you on social media? Um, they can find me on my Twitter handle, which is PeakyCat75, I believe. Or they can find me on Facebook if they really feel daring, <laughs> <laughs> which I'll take a message on my Facebook. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say Tweety, Twitter is probably the best way to find me. Okay. Um, yeah. And we'll include links in the show notes as well if people have yeah, questions. Yeah, I can put, I don't know, do you, uh, you have Instagram? I have Instagram as yes. well. But I mainly use Twitter for my history. I think no. a, a lot of historians almost primarily or exclusively use Twitter. Yeah, it's it's very it's a good way to reach the masses um, and things. I mean, I'm thinking about doing some little projects and restarting my blog that I had um, before I hit grad school, and it's going to be primarily Twitter based, I think. Um, just writing about all the odds and ends that I haven't been able to, you know, get my fingers in while I've been doing graduate school, so. Andy yeah. McMillan, thank you so much for You're sharing welcome. your vast knowledge with us today because it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.